What's going on, Refi Nation? John and Simmer here from Refi Podcast. We are about to drop an episode with Benoit Clement, the Director of Financial Innovation at Vera. The day we recorded this was the same day that they finally announced their public consultation on the tokenization of Vera credits. There were so many new insights that surfaced in this conversation for me. I don't know about you, Simmer. What were some of the like, key takeaways that were highlighted in the conversation? So many. You know, one of the things that I was amazing to witness and see was the openness to innovation while also understanding and I think recognizing the need for integrity and standards and wanting to preserve trust. You know, and I think that sort of double edged sword of you get all this out of the box functionality through crypto, but at the same time with that can lead to certain risks that I think you know, is cause for concern. So I, I think just recognizing one of the key insights was recognizing how on the same page we really are. And it's really about, you know, coordinating, collaborating, finding a path through. And, you know, one of the places I think that we, we were talking with Benoit about was like, you know, DMRV and how important that is to really scale up um, climate action and the climate movement. So, you know, I think there's going to be a lot of fun things we can continue to riff on there, but it, it feels really clear that there's an opportunity to build bridges and work together and a need to actually scale together and create the technologies to allow that to happen. What about you, John? Yeah, digital measurement reporting and verification is absolute key to unlocking this market. He had deep consensus and I think the clear call to action for people to, you know, join into this public consultation, answer the questions that they've asked in a way that they can really make sense of it and to show up to the the webinar on August 30th. You know, this is the opportunity that we've got. And I think there's a great, um, you know, need for, the yeah you know, the crypto market to to come together and create consensus about what the proposal should be for tokenizing fair credits. Um, so yeah, showing up, creating consensus, helping with this public consultation, and making it easy for them to you know flip the switch and begin to allow tokenization of credits in a way that meets you know their concerns because their concerns are valid. Um, the future of the market is definitely going to be digital. Um, I think that's all very clear. They recognize the power of blockchains. They recognize the power of decentralized digital measurement, reporting, and verification, and the time is now. So great opportunity for anyone listening to get involved in refi. Um, but without further ado, it'd be great to, to drop the episode with Benoit. Good morning, Benoit. How you doing, sir? Doing great. And how are uh, you? Loving life. It's a good time to be alive. I'm so grateful to have a chance to speak with you. And we've got so much stuff to dive into, but I thought it'd be great first to start off with your background, your story. I've done a little digging. You seem like an amazing dude and just want to hear your journey so far. I grew up in California. Uh, my career started in finance. I was working in consumer banking to focus on retail lending and credit. Um, yeah, after working in that for seven years, I wanted to feel more fulfillment from the work that I was doing. And that's when I decided to make a hard career transition towards working on environmental programs and projects. I then found myself doing some travels around the East Coast, going through different farms and eco villages, kind of studying ecosystems, soil, trees, and water. And after about a year of doing that, I started taking on projects and programs, usually in an operations and sometimes business development role. And I hit a lot of different sectors from watershed restoration to reforestation to regenerative agriculture, and then also wildfire disaster recovery. I was able to kind of use my project and program management skill sets and systems thinking to apply to a lot of different problems across these different sectors and learned a lot along the way. I more recently started a company called Reforestry. It was a really, uh, it was a startup with a lot of ambition. We wanted to, we wanted to be able to issue microloans to smallholder farmers in aggregate. So that way we could perform regenerative agroforestry development at a landscape scale. So transforming entire communities at the same time through microloans that would be initiated through a mobile app. 
uh, worked on that for a year and a half, was building lots of partnerships in Central America and also East Africa, uh, spent some time in Burundi where we had some off takers that were interested in this. Um, ultimately, we didn't make our fundraising target and it was right around the time that we reached the end of our runway that uh, I got picked up by Vera and that's where I am now. I currently serve as Vera's Director of Financial Innovations. The focus of my work is maybe in two or three categories, um, that being where does tokenization and blockchain fit in terms of the potential applications to carbon markets. Another bucket would be insurance, looking at different insurance products for carbon markets and carbon-related products. And then kind of secondary market instruments, broadly speaking. And um, yeah, that's where a lot of my time and focus is right now. Nice, man. Yeah. And you were actually using some Web3 and you know artificial intelligence tech at Reforestry, is that right? Yeah, we were part of our solution was wanting to use NFTs to capture environmental and social data that could be effectively, you know, minted in a sort of baseball card like fashion where investors could essentially say, here's my portfolio of this desert and, you know, very um, challenged community and be able to see the development through time, how um, the NFTs that would be captured over time, these, these, these um, pieces of environmental and social data that would continue to be minted over time on the same projects could, you could see the, the, the evolution of these projects in your portfolio, so to speak, of these tokens and be able to um, use those trading cards to demonstrate the value created by the investments in those projects. So yeah, that was, that was, that was part of our solution. Yeah. Wow. It's so cool that you were even, you know, like thinking, I feel like there's so much that's happening. That's like very resonant with all the things that you were thinking about, you know, at, in making the step, I think to Vera, I'm curious, Benoit, how, you know, how has some of the thinking you sort of like, you know, dive deep into there with reforestry, how that, how has that been bringing some of that to Vera and what that, what, what has that been like? Yeah. Um, Working in an innovations role at Vera is, it's exciting. I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of opportunity. I mean, we're, we're effectively, we're in these really privileged positions where we can spend our time and energies speaking with different market participants, looking at the emerging technologies and markets and seeing what is out there. And it's exciting to think about how, we're, we're sort of moving into this third industrial revolution and how, you know, the ways in which we communicate, the ways in which transportation takes place and the way in which we exchange goods and services is, is fundamentally shifting again through Web3 and, and other vehicles. So it's exciting working at Vera and being able to bring some of these more innovative ways of thinking and bridging these emerging technologies to systems that, you know, are starting to become legacy, almost archaic, um, on this hockey stick of uh, rampant technology advancement. Um, so it, it's exciting. It's exciting. It's a little bit overwhelming at times because there's so much changing so quickly. It's a lot to keep up on and, uh, you can't know everything. So you really need to build really good relationships and trust that you're going to be able to support yourself with the people who have the knowledge and expertise that, and the same uh, intentions and values to drive and build the future that we want to see moving forward. Well said. Yeah, man. F feels like a similar role I'm in, <laughs> but not in a legacy <laughs> institution with a huge reputation and lots of, uh, lots of supply in store. Um, I'd be curious to just get your take on the role that Vera plays in addressing climate change. Some of our listeners will know Vera intimately and others don't. What is it? What's the role that it plays? And yeah, yeah. how does the voluntary carbon market fit within the bigger picture in your mind? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. So Vera catalyzes a transition towards the green, sustainable future that we all want to see. We're both a standards body and a registry. We use our standards to be able to encourage investment into projects that are creating a positive impact on climate, projects that would be classified as sustainable development, and the investments into these projects, so long as they follow the methodologies that fall under the standards that we create, are eligible for being issued different types of assets, um, such as carbon credits. Those carbon credits can provide additional revenue streams to those projects to help make them financially viable. And so this is Vera's role in developing both standards to ensure that the projects that are being invested in are in fact helping aid in this transition uh, that helps us you know, combat climate change and develop a more equitable future for all. And the registry function is really just being able to hold um, records of these carbon credits, who has them, who, you know, what the current status on them are. So corporates who are looking to offset their emissions could potentially retire these emissions, uh, retire these carbon credits, rather. They can retire these carbon credits, and we keep records mm -hmm. of uh, any carbon credit that's been issued, any carbon credit that's been retired for making offset claims for corporate emissions. And so that's our function. It's sort of ser it's serving as a standards body and a vehicle for catalyzing greater investment into climate action and sustainable development. And, and specifically on like the voluntary side of the market, right? Where there's, I think was one of the key insights as I was getting into the space is that, you know, people are of their own volition and from shareholder pressure and kind of public sentiment, paying money for other people to do positive climate action. And Vera comprises, what is the latest data point, like 80% of the voluntary carbon market right now, or give or take, is that about right? Yeah, I've seen some reports between 60 and 70%. Okay. Um, Vera does hold a really large market share, and there's obviously advantages and disadvantages to being such a huge player <laughs> in the market. I mean, there's a lot of pressure mm -hmm. uh, to perform. It incentivizes change, but also at the same time creates a lot of reflection around what kind of changes we want to make and what the implications are to the reputation, because we obviously have a very significant impact on the overall perception of the integrity of carbon markets, of the environmental integrity of carbon credits. And so the actions that we take are taken quite seriously and you know, our, our role within BCM is to continue trying to uphold that integrity, both from an environmental and a market perspective. We want to continue building the trust mm -hmm. of investors, the asset management firms, all the different institutions that want to see this transition towards mm -hmm. um, this more sustainable world that we would like to continue mm -hmm. living in. So beautiful. Um, you know, one of the things I, I would also love to hear more about, Benoit, is, you know, you talk about the standards, the methodologies and the integrity. Could you just say more about, you know, just like what that means both to you and to Vera? And what are the things that are really important in thinking about that to you guys? Yeah. So our, our flagship program, the Verified Carbon Standard VCS program, this this standard encompasses a lot of different types of methodologies. These methodologies are applicable to various kinds of project activity types, project activity types that might fall under agroforestry and other land use, project activity types that might fall under more um, technical projects such as renewable energy projects or carbon capture and storage facilities. We have under the standard many different types of methodologies that outline how these different types of project activity types could potentially be eligible for receiving carbon credits as a result of the emissions reductions or removals that they perform. So the importance for us in regards to these programs, uh, the, the program and the standards and methodologies that um, 
that constitute this program is we hold this incredibly important to us and it's it's a it's a constant evolution that's taking place for this program where we are regularly doing revisions updates and additions to these programs to the standards to the methodologies that fall within them um we're constantly seeing new technologies being created. These technologies are providing us new kinds of data points. These data points are providing us with new analyses, which sometimes can indicate that our previous way of thinking could benefit from some adjustment to help us actually move even closer towards reaching the targets, the kinds of impacts that we're looking to make. So um, while the standards and methodologies are really important and should be followed for any kind of park carbon project development, um, it's also important that we maintain uh, their flexibility to be able to continue evolving towards more and more improved sets of standards and methodologies. So, yeah, this is this is you know a core part of our work. In the simplest term, you know, the the standards and methodologies are defining like what is the assumption around the planet positive behavior that people are doing that we want to incentivize them to do and how we can verify that that's actually happening. And Mm -hmm. correct me if I'm wrong, but integrity seems to be a kind of um, difficult term to pin down. I know that the ICVCM, um, the Integrity Council for Voluntary Card Market, really struggled to come up with an objective definition for integrity. But it, it seems to be integral, you know, integral, a key facet of building trust. Yeah. Like, how do you guys define integrity yeah. at Vera? Yeah, it's a great question. It's, um, as you said, it, it can have a lot of different kinds of interpretations. Um, I think what we're seeing come up quite regularly across organizations in our industry is a lot of concern around the permanence of projects. That's a topic that comes up a lot. And for those that are maybe less familiar with the term of permanence, we're asking ourselves, you know, how how permanent is the removal or reduction of the emissions for this project? There are some risks, for example, when we look at nature-based projects, reforestation, for example, a wildfire can wipe that out. And now, you know, we're looking at this, this permanence risk where the carbon that we had hoped would be removed from the atmosphere from this project is now in fact released back to the atmosphere. So there are some general perceptions, you know, similarly that technology solutions are perhaps having lower permanence risk. So when we talk about integrity, it's important to look at things like permanence. It's important also to look at things like transparency What are the prices that are being paid for these various types of carbon credits? And when we're looking at these carbon credits, another element is when we think about environmental integrity, I think it's also important to consider social impact. It's great to plant a forest, but we should not be doing so at the expense of others. We should not be, you know, for example, um, diminishing the quality of life for communities by forcing certain kinds of carbon project solutions into their region if they are not going to necessarily benefit from the project themselves. It would be much more ideal if we could look at carbon credits that have both environmental impact but also co-benefits that provide benefit to those communities as well. So perhaps, you know, uh, education or youth employment, et cetera. Um, When we think about integrity, I tend to look at it from the lens of both environmental and social for these reasons, to look at things from a more holistic perspective. Um, The transparency part on the actual impacts is really important. It helps provide some, some, connection to the pricing of those carbon projects as well. When we can see the activities that are actually taking place, we can then begin to understand more intimately why a carbon credit is being priced at the price that it is. Right now, there's a lot of opaqueness, a lot of opacity. Um, 
when we look at carbon credits in general, it's difficult to understand what it is that we're paying for. It's difficult to understand what the actual impact is. It's difficult to understand who was consulted for these projects. You know, was there any, mm. were there any stakeholder consultations to the local communities to, you know, what was it an environmental impact assessment? I mean, there's sometimes just a lot of things that are left in the dark and it's, you know, our goal to continue trying to increase transparency, to continue increasing the impact, not just from an environmental perspective, but also social as well, which is why Vera also has uh, this other program, SD Vista, the Sustainable Development Verified Impact Standard uh, Assets. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's we, we look at these things as holistically as we can, and we're constantly trying to develop solutions to be able to address integrity from multiple angles, because it is kind of mm -hmm. ambiguous. And I think it's important not to have tunnel vision when considering the definition mm -hmm. of integrity. And hearing you talk, I can definitely see, um, yeah, how blockchain plays a role in part of this discovery of what integrity means and how integrity unlocks scale in the carbon market. I would love to do like a quick background to where we are today and then maybe shift gears into, you know, what is this consultation that you've just announced uh, on your website? There's, you know, a 60 day public consultation on the tokenization of um, Vera credits, which is, you know, a welcome milestone, I think, in the climate action journey. But I think it'd be interesting to look just briefly at how we got here. And some of the challenges that we're facing as we're struggling with how do we deal with integrity? How do we deal with transparency, scale? You know, how do we prevent double counting? Um, so I'll do a quick expose and then we maybe you can like unpack some of the yeah, perceptions or differences you had. But um, really, this is, you know, last nine months is what brought me into the climate action space most prominently. Um, I was building a list of projects at the intersection of climate crypto, saw this thing called Klimadao and was very interested in this promise of, you know, both doing good and having an opportunity to make money. But I had no idea about the carbon market. And I think a lot of people were in a similar position to myself. And the key narrative that Klimadao was espousing was to basically create a black hole to kind of suck up this finite supply of low quality old credits from the market. Yeah. And in doing so, the theory was that mm -hmm. it would raise the, the floor price of carbon and then suddenly make it possible for a bunch of new projects to emerge and for corporates to really have to pay for the, the true environmental and social cost of these assets. And I, I was definitely surprised. I think everybody on, you know, Klima and Toucan were surprised that this promise resulted in like one of the fastest billion dollar market cap assets in history. But what we quickly realized, and I think Vera likely did also, because there was an announcement in November basically distancing you know, Vera from these types of activities, was that um, there was this dormant supply of credits that hadn't been issued that were suddenly waking up because now there was a source of demand for credits that you know, people could basically sell you know, old low quality credits into um, that otherwise they couldn't sell in the market. There wasn't corporate demand for it. And I remember specifically, I was having a conversation with some of the, the core team at Klimadao and it was clear that there was like a lack of recognition that this was a fact because there was a lack of transparency on Vera's side about like how many credits were there actually waiting to be issued that had been verified but not issued yet. And um, we saw, I think, 22 million tons of, you know, Vera carbon credits coming on chain as a result of this demand. Um, but things started to taper as, you know, the kind of Ponzi-nomics petered out and the economic benefit of bringing these carbon credits on chain lessened. And at the same time, we saw the folks of like Carbon Plan basically raise this issue of what they called zombie credits, which I think is a really interesting issue to unpack. And you know, from my perspective, this definitely comes from the supply side of the market. It's just that Crypto has basically made it uh, possible to see because suddenly there's a source of demand for these credits that nobody knew about. Um, and then w the next major milestone in my mind was obviously May 25th. Vera announced the kind of the prohibition or ban of tokenizing credits that had been retired in the Vera registry. There were multiple concerns mentioned, you know, double counting, but also know your customer. And suddenly the whole like momentum of carbon on chain stopped. 
And until today, people have been kind of waiting to figure out when's this public consultation. I know probably five or six entrepreneurs who've raised venture capital looking to launch, you know, technology on top of these on-chain credits that are that are waiting, basically. And now we've got 60 days to have a conversation with folks like you and other people in Vera to talk about, like, how do we deal with this energy in Web3? How do we deal with this issue of transparency and also enable a more effective market? Um how is that for a kind of background to where we are today in terms of the on-chain market of Vera? Did I miss anything? Is there anything you disagree with or anything you want to provide texture to? Yeah. Um, I think you hit a lot of really good key points. It's, um, I'd like to maybe add a little bit to the, the, the difficulty with having some of these, you know, as they were coined, zombie credits coming back onto the market. It's, it's tricky sometimes when you're looking at having retail investors buying and selling, trading these carbon credits that they effectively know very little, if not nothing about, but there's this hype, you know, (laughs) if there's anything that, you know, crypto markets in general are probably the best at arguably it's hype. You know, it's, it's really, they're, they're really good at getting people excited about a lot of things and excitement, generally speaking, drives prices up. But if you're driving up the price of something that's virtually worthless, we're not really doing anybody a favor here. And in fact, you're actually eroding the the trust, the, the integrity of the market that's underlying that because now people realize, oh, well, the carbon credits we were buying, selling, and trading are effectively garbage credits. The, this creates, you know, um, it creates some damages that are – you know, take some time to recover from. And there's a lot of exciting applications, a lot of opportunities, I think, for blockchain and tokenization within this space. It's critical that we approach that in a manner that is going to be conducive to bolstering the integrity of these markets and not risking the perception of trust and integrity of them. I, I totally agree. And um, I think, you know, one of the clear insights was like, of the billion dollar market cap of Klima, how much went to project developers? Mm-hmm. How much went to taking carbon out of the atmosphere and avoiding it from being emitted? You know, that's a thing I really care about. And I think that's something we should all really care about. And we don't know because that transaction history isn't on chain yet. So I think there's something there. But, but also I would ask, wouldn't those credits be coming to life later in the climate journey anyway? Because as the you know supply shock that is pending ensues, the demand keeps rising, the price is inevitably going to rise as people fulfill these net zero targets. These zombie credits are still in Vera's registry. They're likely going to be you know sought after at a future date. And actually, crypto just expedited the process of discovering they're there. Would you agree with that sentiment? I would. I would share that there are both buyers who are interested in both low quality carbon credits, and they're in. There are also buyers who are interested in higher quality carbon credits. Generally speaking, we're going to be seeing a trend where carbon credits with later vintages, with issuances that are more recent in time, generally speaking, are going to be sold for more in comparison to later vintages, to later issuances. The older carbon credits become, generally speaking, they're going to be priced lower and lower. There's some different speculations as to why that is. Some of it has to do with the standards, the methodologies being updated, being revised to be improved, to demonstrate better thinking or better applications of technology to really determine the quality of the impact that's being provided. So with enhancements in digital monitoring, reporting, and verification, we would think that the impact is much more likely that it's that it's correct. So... Yeah, there could very well be purchasers. I mean, there are purchases for those kinds of lower carbon credits. The agendas behind these organizations, the ones that are interested in lower quality carbon credits versus the ones that are interested in higher quality carbon credits are are different, I would say. Um, My speculation would be that the companies looking to purchase lower lower quality carbon credits are probably more concerned with having... Um, a, a corporate sustainability report that simply states we've you know offset our emissions by this amount, and there's maybe low 
stakeholder or low shareholder requirements that are concerned about the actual impact or quality of those credits. Whereas other companies were becoming under increasing scrutiny of their uh, sustainability claims, for example, Shell, who's been taken to court m- multiple times in the last few years for greenwashing claims, etc., they are likely to be much more concerned with the quality, with the integrity of those carbon credits and are therefore more incentivized to purchase the higher quality, higher price carbon credits. So, um, you know, I think it's interesting that, you know, crypto can, um, I mean, as you've pointed out, make more aware of the available supply. I think it's going to be important that we figure out how liquidity can be increased in a way that doesn't jeopardize trust in these markets. And just building off of that, Benoit, can you maybe share, give a little bit of an insight behind the scenes, like as all this was happening in the refi space, you know, what was it like at Vera? What were some of the things or some of the reactions and help us just bring us to the journey of here now releasing this sort of public consultation? What have you guys been thinking about? What's been top of mind? What have, what has been your journey, you know, in witnessing how the market has unfolded around you? Yeah, what we've seen, I mean, as was outlined, these events in November and May where we, you know, first we began distancing ourselves and then in May we, we you know, um, made an announcement stating that we will not permit the, the, the tokenization of any of our instruments. Um, there's a lot of misinterpretations of that message, um, drawn, you know, stories that are simply just not true. I mean, saying that like Vera hates crypto or we're, we're, we're anti web three or, you know, we're, you know, we're, we're, we're attacking these specific market players. We have a responsibility as an organization that especially as one that holds such a significant market share to uphold the quality, the integrity of these carbon credits and the market and To do so, we need to be able to ensure that the practices of tokenization are going to be done in a way that doesn't jeopardize those things. So it's been it's been challenging. There's 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 a lot of investment being placed into crypto and carbon startups and the mesh between the two that are wanting to provide tokenization services. Um, it's, it's something that we're keen to figure out. It's something that requires a lot of heavy lifting. This isn't, you know, it's not an easy decision. There's a lot of information that needs to be collected. There's a lot of information that needs to be, um, disseminated. And then, you know, this, this has a lot of different kinds of implications across lots of different market participants up and down and across the value chains. So it's, it's unfortunately, it's not as simple as flipping a light switch and saying like, okay, we can tokenize now. It's, it's going to be this public consultation that we've launched is primarily focused on understanding how we can approach third party tokenization of carbon credits it's mostly focused on a few buckets like fraud, uh, environmental integrity, uh, regulatory uncertainty, uh, the anonymity of entities, and then also legal uncertainty. Um, I, if I might unpack just a little bit each one of those, um, fraud being, you know, it's it's the, the technical nature of of crypto markets can make it difficult for people to know whether what they're buying is a real instrument or if it's a scam. Um, When we look at environmental integrity as being another one of those buckets that we're exploring through this consultation is, yeah, it's double issuance or double use of these crypto instruments or tokens. Um, It could also be um, when you consider the, the energy expenditure for transacting how many times does a token does a carbon token need to be traded before the the one ton of emissions it represents is effectively, you know, gone? Um, could you actually have a, a carbon token that's been traded so many times that now it's actually have it has a negative impact on the environment? 
You definitely could. You, know, so, you definitely could. <laughs> you know, what kind of measures can we put in place to, you know, the, the whole purpose of these carbon credits is to have a positive climate impact. So how do we ensure that that's going to happen when you can now open up all of this additional trading, for example? Um, you know, what's the sustainability? What's the energy use consumed by these these blockchain providers? You know, the, there's a lot of questions, you know, around the environmental integrity part. Um, regulatory, you know, are these are these going to be considered securities? You know, is the is the Security and Exchange Commission are they going to want to try and regulate this? Is it only going to stay under the CFTC? Um, those are conversations that are probably some of the biggest conversations that need to be had, and it's not going to be a quick one. Um, related to that is the anonymity of entities. So, like how are we, how are we performing processes that allow us to know who is buying and selling these carbon credits? Um, related to that is the anti-money laundering protocols. How do we ensure that we're not helping? How do we know that we're not helping black markets to be able to transact in these things uh, inadvertently? Um, these are all like really important issues that we're going to try to figure out. And we're, we're on this mission to figure these things out, which is why we've launched this public consultation is to get input from, from all entities, from all individuals who are passionate about this. And so, you know, we're, we know that we're going to get some really helpful information through this consultation. Um, and, you know, we look forward to sharing what we learned through that process and continuing to move forward and, and seeing how we can adopt um, some potential measures to either make this a positive path forward um, or look for alternatives. Yeah. Yeah, I appreciate you unpacking some of that because um, I think, you know, I used to lead growth at Toucan and on the surface, it seems like, oh, the solution is very clear. You just introduce a tokenized state into the database. As soon as it's tokenized, you know, the person who's performing the transaction on the bridge, you know, confirms it, the API from whatever the bridging entity is, changes the state in Vera and boom, you're done. Yeah. But I think the question then becomes like, how do you then know it's not being issued on a bunch of different chains at the same time, Polygon, Celo, you know, Cosmos, etc. Yeah. There's definitely that there, and I, I do think there's you know an interesting question around like, um, yeah, the <laughs> like you said, how many times does a carbon credit need to be traded before it can be retired? These things were designed to be retired, and suddenly the tokenization can delay the retirement and enable speculation. But if something's traded 500 times on you know relatively energy intensive blockchains you know, it's useless and, and we're defeating the purpose and we're creating something that's meant to be a positive externality and diluting its importance. So yeah, I really appreciate that, that question there. I think at the same time, I'm also a little bit worried about like the time horizons, you know, this initial announcement was in yeah. May. We're now in August, August 30th is, you know, the consultation date. Um, and I know that there's obviously a kind of yeah October deadline, but then if, if you're really looking for regulatory clarity on the tokenization of these instruments, how long does you know, it take for enough legal entities to create consensus about this? Um, I, I don't know what your take is, but I definitely see this as uh, you know, a pretty big risk for Vera in terms of the market moving beyond legacy and going straight towards Web3 native methodologies, Web3 native standards, Web3 native measurement reporting verification. And suddenly there's the fragmentation we were all looking to avoid is now you know, predominant. So I'm curious how you guys are trying to balance like the quality, the carefulness with also like we've got seven and a half years left to reduce emissions by 50%. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's a great question. I mean, we know that the, the market cap, you know, behind this is huge and it's something that, you know, we would like to be able to have participate in the benefit of climate impact. We're, I mean, as you pointed out, trying to understand the regulatory landscape is probably easily going to be like the biggest hurdle that we're trying to, to move over it. It's this interesting space where, 
you know, if we if we consider if we consider the value proposition of some you know, of, of these crypto companies that are looking at tokenized carbon credits, the, the arguably one of the largest parts of their value proposition is the, the simply just the tokenization, charging a fee for changing the format of a carbon credit into something that has more utility, more function. If that in and of itself is significant enough to address the majority of the market needs within the Web3 space, it's it seems like something that might not be so far out of reach. When we start to look at derivative products, that's where things start to get especially concerning, I would say. Um, as an example, we could have we could have carbon credits right now as they stand being converted to tokens where you know let's say ABC token for each carbon credit where we might have some KYC AML take place on that first tier token mm-hmm. you know that you mean at the issuance at the moment that is issued yeah. 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 Uh, so the moment that a that a, an existing carbon credit, let's say for this example, for the sake of this example, let's say we're ta- we're tokenizing existing carbon credits and not issuing carbon credits immediately on chain. Let's say, for example, we're starting okay. with a carbon credit that already exists and we want to tokenize it. So we're we're effectively immobilizing this carbon credit, issuing a token, minting a token. Um, when we look at derivative products that could potentially have concerning impacts on carbon markets, on prices. Take, for example, you have ABC token that represents, it's a digital representation of this carbon credit. Now, if you're like, let's say you take a bunch of these ABC tokens and issue a new token that's representative of maybe a pool of those tokens, or even just the token themselves, if you had another one-to-one conversion. But now you call that ABC plus, The market, the the consumer perception between ABC and ABC plus can be communicated and interpreted in so many different ways where ABC might have had to have been tokenized following some kind of process, some kind of protocol outlined by the standards themselves. But now when you're having a token of a token, a tokenized, you know, token, you know, a second tier, a new um a new level of tokenization that's taking place off of that base token. We're starting to lose some of the control parameters between the initial carbon credit, the environmental benefit and this derivative product. There can now be actions that take place with this second tier token that are perhaps being misconceived as being um, ABC tokens. The only difference is ABC plus. So if you have this ABC token and now you've issued another token off of this ABC token and you're calling it ABC plus, well, you know, it's, you figure this is, this is basically a Vera carbon credit. It's, it's basically the same thing, but this ABC plus token, is it necessarily following the same kinds of regulations or protocols that are put into place for that first ABC token? And now with that token being so similar in nature, ABC versus ABC plus, ABC plus, you figure this is a better token or it's the same thing, but even better. And now these tokens could potentially be driven up in speculation. Um, If at any point there is, um, say, like a decline in um, carbon credit pricing, the markets take a downward swing and you've got the value of this carbon credit uh, through these tokens being staked, could there not be an instance where there's effectively a margin call that takes place that triggers a huge sell-off and then you end up having this bullwhip effect that now just sends price volatility um, to extremes that we don't want to see in this market? I just want to go for that second thought because like, why would we not want to see price volatility in the voluntary carbon market to those extremes? Right. Well, because it, it erodes trust. It, beca- it becomes this, it becomes this investor risk where all of a sudden it's like, wow, like you're not going to get major 
you're not going to get major players that are going to be wanting to throw their, you know, millions or billions of dollars into something that can gain 50 or 100 or 2 or 300 percent or lose all of its value like we've seen in crypto markets sometimes. Um, that, 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 that extreme level of volatility is not something that would instill investor trust into further climate action and sustainable development. Yes, we want to see changes over time. That's just in you know that that's that's inherent in in any kind of market in the in the pricing of any kind of product. But there are healthy there are healthy spectrums that one would like to see in markets to be able to allow for greater investment to take place in these markets. When you start in, introducing these huge swings, especially when they're downward. Um, this creates a lot of risks um, that that inhibit further investment and create um, greater distrust, and that's 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 one of the biggest challenges that we're facing. Is you know how can we ensure that derivative products created off of these is not going to actually erode confidence in these markets? It's such a delicate balance, too. Yeah. You know, and, and it, it seems in Benoit, it seems like part of what I'm hearing is like. There is this openness to innovation, 100%. Like, hey, let's explore. And there's very clearly a, we need to, you know, it's important to preserve the integrity and the trust that we have, right? And so, in, you know, in, at least that's what I'm hearing. You know, it's like not a, again, it's not like a, we're not opposed, we're not opposed to this. It's, we want to do this in a way that yeah. preserves integrity and trust. And we're trying to figure out how we build that bridge. Yeah. Conversely, there's also potentially great benefits with derivative products. I mean, you could be creating these pools mm -hmm. of, of similar tokens. Like say you wanted to pool all of the agroforestry tokens and you want to pool all of the sea forest mm. tokens and be able to sell these new derivative products to certain types of clientele through these marketing schemes that are, are really geared towards, let's say, surfers. You, you want all the surfers to be buying these blue carbon token pools because you've created this new derivative that that you know really speaks to a specific audience type so you're actually driving more investment towards blue carbon projects that would be yeah. amazing of course yeah. transparent and you can make it automated you can build games sure. on it you can build entire yeah. you know financial yeah. systems that, that into would space. be amazing yeah totally at, at the same time yeah. how do you ensure that these instruments that are being created are not being created and not just not being created, but also being managed in a manner that doesn't allow for adverse effects to take place. I mean, I don't think anybody, pre well, that's maybe not true. <laughs> there are some predictions for the 2008 housing financial crisis. There were some people that were trying to blow the whistle and, and warn and alert us of that. But I think when these products were initially created, you know, we saw opportunity. We saw opportunity for additional funds, additional investment to be driven into some of these you know, kinds of areas. And ultimately, when you take out ethics and morals and you're creating new projects or products or you're managing those products in a way where ethics and morals are, are not part of your equation for, for doing business, we saw how that created this, this global financial crisis as a result. So, you know, it, it's important that, you know, the actors who are going to be involved in this evolution um, are, are thinking with the best interest of our future generations and the planet in mind. So that, that, that's a really hard, that's a really hard thing to, to, to steer. You know, it's, it's, yeah, there's no yeah. knowing everything. It's a real you, know, you have to make some, you have to make some attempts. You have to do some experiments. You are going to stub your toe sometimes, but we need to at least have our ears open and be willing to consider and when appropriate experiment mm -hmm. and, you know, continue learning along the way. I hear you and I'm grateful you've taken on the helm of <laughs> addressing this challenge and it sounds like they've hired the right guy. Um, I know we're coming to the end of our time here. I just wanted to touch on two pieces because I read the Time Magazine article with Robin Ricks in detail and was fascinated to see a couple interesting 
points here. A misconception on Times Take saying, in effect, Carbon Place wasn't a blockchain, but actually they're leveraging private blockchain through consensus. And the thought that you know the voluntary carbon market might lean into private blockchain space as opposed to public to take the benefit of you know transparency, you know, and all the the different factors that blockchains provide without having you know the additional risk that public blockchains provide. Um, and in doing so, I spoke to quite a few people from like you know major consultancy firms and heard these kind of horror stories of corporate actors coming together to create private blockchains and recognizing the game theory behind these plays are, are really set up for failure because it has a huge incentives for you know an individual actor to defect. And if your validated network starts falling apart, it's very easy for this you know, could, to go to dust. And so I just wanted to get your thoughts on private versus public blockchain and um, where you guys are playing on this and how you're factoring that into your considerations as you so, move forward. So like if we were to take Carbon Place, that specifically, for example, um, where I could see the interest in engaging in some sort of experiment from that lens I think it's I think the draw there is working with institutions who are bound by regulations. I don't see so much the draw being the fact that it would be private, but this is my this is my perception. I personally prefer a public approach for the reason that it further enforces KYC and AML protocols. I mean it's it's this is also sort of this um, interesting dichotomy you see in, in, in the Web3 space. You know, you've got some players who are all about complete anonymity, which does not lend itself to KYC AML practices. And then you've got this other side of the spectrum that's very pro, you know, just open everything, transparent everything, which, you know, I myself, when I look at myself and as an individual, I don't really fall on either extreme. I think that there's great applications for either side, depending on the context. I close the door when I use the restroom because I want my own privacy. There are certain things that maybe just don't need to be shared with the outside world. But at the same time, there are things that certainly should be. And that's a difficult line to navigate. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a difficult dance and, and context I think is everything. And, you know, I would like to see one where there's this consensus mechanism where the standards bodies who are pioneering, you know, the the transition towards sustainable development and climate action to operate on some sort of consensus mechanism. I really like the idea of having cooperative, collaborative work being performed to uh, work towards hitting our climate goals and, and less so of having these like behind closed doors kinds of approaches where we can't see what's actually happening. I don't feel that it instills trust. I don't feel that that also um, allows for avenues for greater innovation to take place. I've seen a lot of really great initiatives take place with open source and public approaches. So that's, that's where my general preferences lean. Um, but yeah, how we all, all go about it, I think is going to be a, a really big question that we're going to have to work on for the, you know, indefinite future. And we have a question from our listeners, Benoit. Hi, I'm Haley Mahler. I'm with Fallow, which is a marketplace for, uh, businesses and individuals to be able to buy high quality carbon credits. My question for Vera is, what can the refi or regenerative finance community do to be the best possible partner to registries who are looking to innovate and also to scale, help scale the market with integrity? Yeah. Um, one of the most beneficial ways is to engage with the standards bodies and their public consultations. So we get bombarded like every day with requests from various web three companies that want to tokenize this tokenize that they want updates. They want to be in this or that. I think the best thing that individuals and organizations can do is engage in the public consultation processes, provide your input, provide your feedback. Um, the more clear you can be in your communication, the better through those public consultation processes. When there are working groups, that are established, participate in the working groups, try to, you know, contribute to constructive conversations. 
um, it's, it's overwhelming sometimes when we're just being bombarded with a lot of individual requests that we cannot just do these like one-off, um, exceptions for every single, you know, organization that has an idea. It's like, Oh, Hey, we want to try this. Hey, we want to try that. It's, it's, there's so much work involved with being able to do a single one of those and just trying to field the dozens of requests that we get every week is not a productive use of our time. It would be better if we could actually spend that time in the public consultation work and in the working groups where we're, you know, we've got some direction, we've got some parameters that we're working with. Um, and so, yeah, one of the most helpful ways that pe- that individuals can participate would be in engaging in those public consultations and working groups as they arise. Yeah. Which basically, in this case, means showing up to the webinar on August 30th and providing input. Is that it? Is that the only behavior? What are the other behaviors people can do? Is it, you know, I'm just curious what specific yeah. actions people can um, take. Something that I, I, I personally find really helpful. So in addition to sending in the responses to the questions provided in the public consultation, in addition to participating in working groups, um, drafting models, showing us use cases, um, the, the sharing of processes and visuals, you know, it's like the saying that a picture paints a thousand words. It's, it communicates ideas and concepts so much more quickly than trying to read a 15 page email or a 15 page, you know, concept note. It can help a lot when somebody's able to show us like, Hey, here's a model, here's a process flow. Um, you know, or here's a, a, even if it's a text-based document, here's a process document on how this operates. Um, The visuals and process systems oriented thinking is really helpful instead of getting linear communications that we have to create three-dimensional renditions of in our own minds to try and comprehend the greater system. So, um, people who can build those kinds of things, Ooh. I think, are of great help. People who can consider um, the various requirements from different market participant angles. For example, what, is, what, what do standards bodies need? What do regulatory bodies, like what is the CFTC going to need? You know, what, what is the requirement of a carbon token? What is an investor's uh, use case requirements for a carbon token, gathering all those requirements from these different market participant angles, uh, collecting those, considering those perspectives and designing uh, a product, an asset, a token with those considerations in mind can streamline a lot of this process and help us at least begin to create some kind of semblance, some kind of simulation, a prototype of what this looks like. And that can help in the process of acquiring additional legal counsel, you know, as we begin to formulate what this potentially could look like together, you know, we're, we're, we're wanting to identify what this could look like and the process towards moving towards that, I think could be something that is very collaborative in nature. And so collecting this information, presenting it in visually in, you know, ways that are, that are helpful and, and, and effective manners of communication are all very welcome. But it also sounds like there's a need for Web3 actors to group together and create consensus on their own rights. You're not yeah. getting hit from a thousand different angles. I mean, I've personally have seen, you know, a number of startups to hundreds of different ventures, the intersection of carbon and crypto, and actually to come together to create a shared point of view and to present a clear case as a representation of a bunch of actors. It, it seems to be, you know, a great lens as opposed to just everyone hitting their own points because, you know, it's, it's going to be a difficult thing to navigate and we don't have time, right? We have to come up with good enough. Enough. We have to satisfy the needs of the actors that you described, and we got to get to scaling this market because time's running out. So, 
I would love just in the last three or four minutes here, uh, as we wrap up, give me your vision for the future of the voluntary carbon market and Vera's role in it. You mentioned digital monitoring, reporting, verification, which is something I've done a huge deep dive into. What's it look like in the next yeah. five, um, five, seven years? My, my perspective is that we're going to see digital monitoring, reporting, and verification be inherent in all carbon project development perhaps almost to a point where we're not seeing third-party auditors, for example, the, these, these validation and verification bodies having to do the same kinds of on-site assessments that they currently need to do. I think through IoT, uh, through remote sensing, satellite imagery, we're going to be able to actually have a lot of these processes circumvent the need for a lot of third-party auditing services. It's not to say that those third-party auditor services can provide those technologies or do calibrations or other kinds of um, useful services to support that. But I think the role of the VVB is going to change dramatically. The role of auditors, I think, is going to change dramatically as processes become more digitized and become more public. Um, I would love to see DMRV basically any kinds of data points being recorded publicly and being fed into uh, these automated processes for issuances, retirements of uh, carbon credits. And that's where, you know, I see the scale being able to rapidly increase the transparency, rapidly, you know, expanding and the integrity being much stronger as a result um, of those first two. Um, yeah. Absolutely. And so, you know, for listeners who are catching up on terms, you know, basically there's 28 VVBs, um, verification mm-hmm. uh, and validation bodies, whatever it is through Vera around the world that go around and basically on the ground, measure yeah. the circumference of trees, write down stuff by hand. It's an incredibly manual okay. labor intensive process. And it's a huge yeah. bottleneck to scaling supply. And what's happening is we're in introducing these other layers through, like you said, you know, Internet of Things, little sensors in the soil or, you know, in a a weather station, drones, satellite imagery, but also people on the ground calibrating these large data sets and machine learning models to create really high confidence assumptions about, you know, how much carbon is sequestering here. And so that for me was my big call to action this summer was we need a revolution in the DMRV space. We need so much investment and energy into that because if we can unlock scalable DMRV, we will see massive growth for people on the planet. So thank you for being full in on this, Benoit. It's been an absolute pleasure speaking with you. I'm so grateful to have a chance and see us as an ally. If there's anything we can do to help build bridges, make sense of this as you're navigating the public consultation and feel free to reach out. Simmer and I are both here and you know, we're rooting for you. Thank you, Simmer. It's been a really great conversation. Thank you for asking very, very provocative questions. They're very important questions that need to be considered and um, I'm glad to have been able to have this opportunity to to share with you both. Yeah, it's been such a joy. 